Hello and welcome to Working Scientist, a Nature Careers podcast. I'm Julie Gould. This is the fourth episode in a series about female scientists in Latin America. One challenge that many women face, whatever career path they're in and wherever they are in the world, is how to balance having a family and continuing on in their career. There is never a good time to have kids, is a phrase I've heard a lot when it comes to this conversation. But for some women in academia, choosing that time comes with many factors to consider. In Latin America, as I've learnt, women are penalised for having children. The small career break that they take to take care of the newborns, a time that should be full of joy and wonder, and let's face it, emotional roller coasters and tiredness galore too, is often tainted by the concerns over how this will affect their careers. Mariana Viglino, a young female Latin American paleontologist based in Patagonia in the south of Argentina, and who we heard from in the third episode of this series, has seen how colleagues view pregnancy and maternity and how they worry about starting families. Not because they don't want to, it's just they are not able because the the academic community is not taking into account the pressure and the time-consuming task about raising a kid. So that usually means that you as a woman who's in charge of your family, you're going to be left behind for sure. There are actually many colleagues here who view that if you have a kid, particularly doing your PhD, you're just finishing your career. That means the end of your career. They don't view that you can, you're can you going to be able to do research just because you're going to have a kid. Uh, so that's still, I think, a prevalent idea that some colleagues have. It is for this reason and some others that you'll hear about that Fernanda Stanisławski from Brazil founded the Parent in Science movement. Fernanda Stanisławski always knew that she was going to be a scientist and her career path was very linear for the first while. She majored in biology in college, worked in a research lab on plant defence systems whilst at university, entered a PhD programme and finished at age 27, then spent two years at the University of Toronto in Mississauga doing a postdoc before returning to Brazil. And I got uh, hired at the university as a a professor. So uh, up to this point, my career was pretty linear. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. I was receiving grants. I had some grants from uh, Asian, uh, funding agencies here in Brazil. I have some grants from uh, international foundations and everything was fine. And I had my lab. I was advising students at the, uh, the graduate level. So everything was okay until I, got, I had my son. Fernanda was on track to becoming a full professor. But she was still at the beginning of her career when her first son was born in 2013, when she was 32 years old. In Brazil, new mothers get six months leave. This is generous compared to other Latin American countries, Fernanda tells me. But... When we come back after the leave, it doesn't mean that we do not have any other responsibilities with the children we are uh, raising. So, of course, I did not have as much time as I was used to have. And everything impacted my productivity. This includes publications, advising students, applying for grants, etc., etc. You know what it is. Since 2014, all my applications for grants, fellowships, everything, uh, it came back uh, saying that I was not uh, producing as uh, much as my peers. And that gave me a really uh, bad feeling that, okay, maybe... I'm not able to keep up with my career because I decided to have children. So maybe I I was never meant to be a science or anything. And that was really bad because having children did not make me uh, any less committed to my career. But of course, things change. So all the no's I started receiving made me uh, question my my path uh, as uh, being a scientist. But Fernanda didn't give up. She continued to apply for grant funding to support her research. But it was an uphill struggle. Until in 2015, all funding dried up. 2014, I was still having, I was still having some funding. I was still trying to fight back and uh, getting myself back into my my career. So everything was 
kind of okay. But in 2015, everything really changed. I did not have any, had any uh, funding to keep up with my lab or anything. I just had one or two students. So the graduate program was, oh, you're not advising as much as you need and everything like that. So it took a while for me to realize what was happening. So in 2016, we uh, actually made the decision that we will we would do something. This we is a group of other female scientists who were also mothers. I started talking to people that were going through the same thing. And we realized that it was not just me. It was something really bigger than myself. And that's how we decided that we would do something about it. And that's how we, we started the Parenting Science Movement. The Parenting Science Group officially started in 2016. And the first thing they did was to collect data. We didn't have any data from Brazil uh, saying, oh, uh, when you have a child, this happens with your publication records, this happens with the numbers in your career. So we started, uh, the first thing we have done was to conduct a survey with uh, professors here in Brazil. There were parents. And then we showed that uh, as expected, uh, women that have children will have a decrease in their publication records and their productivity. We did not see that for men that had children, so we have this uh, big difference. Uh, and then with this data, we were able to go uh, knock on the doors on the funding uh, agencies at the university and say, oh, you can see here, we have a problem. And it's not something that is individual, it's a structural problem. And that's how the Parenting Science Movement actually started uh, working here and provoking some changes that we have accomplished uh, these few years. So one thing that is, uh, it has become uh, really clear for us is even though the situation here in Brazil is really drastic, uh, we have much more going on than uh, in other countries around here. So. When we look at uh, the initiatives and what's happening uh, in other countries from Latin America, we are kind of ahead on the discussion. Uh, we do have in Chile and uh, in Argentina, some uh, of their funding bodies having some initiatives regarding motherhood specifically, but it's not a lot. And also the numbers of women in science in Brazil are a little higher than we have in, uh, in other countries. So we are trying to, uh, we have started uh, doing a, a survey, uh, trying to gather all the information we have from all the funding bodies uh, in many of the countries from Latin America to actually have a, a, a clear view of what's happening on the region. And if there is anything, there is common ground that we can work together to change. But what we have so far is something more, there isn't, even in some countries, there isn't even people talking about this. Women in science in general, but even more specifically about uh, parents in science. So it's going to be quite a challenge to uh, actually see something happening in a few of the countries we have a look at. When the movement started presenting data to funding bodies, research institutions and universities, they were all very receptive to the conversations. But we still have a lot of conversations and not actual practices being implemented. So uh, we never had any, anyone like denying that there was a problem explicitly. We know that. But the, that does not mean that they will actually engage in doing something for real to to, to change that. That has changed since the movement has grown and in 2021 it was awarded the Inspiring Women in Science Outreach Award organised by Nature Research Awards in partnership with the Estee Lauder companies. One place where the Parents in Science group have been advocating for change since 2018 is with the Lattice platform, a database of all Brazilian scientists' CVs. You have to register there to uh, apply for fellowships and uh, funding uh, resources and everything. And uh, at that uh, platform, there was no space to disclose or any information. Oh, I have this gap in my productivity. I have like few years that I didn't publish anything, but there is a reason for that. So in 2021, Lattice added a new field that recognizes that career breaks of all kinds 
not just maternity leave, are part of the academic career journey. The reason that this is important is because if you're applying for any fellowship position, your productivity from the last five to ten years is taken into account. And if that person has had a leave or had had a child uh, during that period, they will uh, extend the period for another two years. So you have a longer view of the career of that scientist that will show they're okay before having a child. She was pr- uh, productive and she had a lot of publications and everything. So that was a, one of the main changes we had here in Brazil. But it still is something that is not not uh, like a national uh, initiative or anything. It depends on the institution. My university has applied that for some of the, the calls they have. You, and also for the high process in my university, they also, they also have included something related to motherhood. But it's still, it's one institution, one graduate program, one funding agency. So the main issue we have, we are having right now, we, it has to be some general rule about all the process for fellowships, funding, anything. It has to include something related to the process that we know that happens on uh, a women's career uh, due to motherhood. It's not just professors and academics that are already in the system that need support. In Brazil, there is no national or federal regulation for students, whether graduate or masters, who need to take maternity leave. Here in Brazil, we have uh, uh, one agency that uh, evaluates all the graduate programs. And one of the things they evaluate is the time the students take to complete their master or PhD uh, degrees. And of course, if you take a leave, you'll be a longer period of time. So they do not want to let you take the leave and, and things like that. So we are working with this agency that is called CAPES um, that oversees all the graduate programs in Brazil. Uh, they already updated the, their platform where they collect all the data for the evaluation, including a field for the students' leaves. And what we want now is, is something really simple. It, you just don't add up the time the, that the student was away on uh, leave on the time we were considering for the the PhD or the master degree uh, completion. So the Brazilian Ministry of Education has now also created a working group. To develop a national policy for the permanence of mothers in the higher education system here in Brazil. So that was a huge, uh, well, it was still very on on the beginning of the working, but it's still a a major uh, advancement here. Small steps have been made, but Fernanda and the Parents in Science group have bigger dreams for the future. The challenge, as always in Latin America, is financial support. However, if we lived in an ideal world, here's what Fernanda would like to see. Mothers and their uh, particular demands are uh, a priority when we are talking about allocating funds for education and science. And that is really far from because... It's not just for the mother when you help uh, a woman that has children to improve their education, their professional aspirations, their professional uh, uh, goals. You will have an in- impact on their children and everything. So it's what, what we, we've been discussing here in Brazil. It's social mobility is really dependent on education and assessing high uh, paying careers that will have to go through having a, 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 oh my God, higher education, uh, having a higher education access and everything. And for professors and researchers that have established careers in academia, Fernanda would like to see some real changes in what is considered an academic career. We have this idea that you have to go your undergrad, your graduate students, then you get a position at the university with no pause, with no de- deviations on this career. So, and that impacts a lot how women progress in their cur- career here in Brazil. In general, I'm not talking about a specific uh, a specific areas of knowledge, uh, women are already uh, the majority of undergrad and graduate students. But if you go further down the line and looking at who are the professors at our universities, who are uh, the people that is leading all the funding agencies, who are our ministers uh, and everything, it's just men. And that's because 
if along the way from being under grad student to becoming a professor, you have any pause or any deviation, will suffer. Your career progression will suffer. So I think the ideal uh, will be to accept that people have uh, different trajectories uh, in their career. And that does not mean commitment. That does not imply they are no, not committed to their career. That does not imply they are not able to pursue a career in, in academia or in science. It's just because life happens. Indeed, life does happen, as it did for Fernanda, whose career in biological research came to a halt when she started her family. If I look back right now, I see it was not, uh, personally, it was not as much as a problem as I was uh, seeing at the time. And that's because, of course, I've matured a lot. But I still think it was pretty drastic when I think about uh, my professional life. Because I made the piece that it was nothing related to myself. So it was not my ability to, to keep up with my career or anything. That I, I, I made my piece with that. I know it wasn't my fault. But it was really devastating regarding my career. Even when I look at today. Of course, because of the parenting science movement and everything I've accomplished. Uh, that is just a really small part of my career. But if I have persisted in the molecular biology field, that would be that would have uh, a really uh, negative impact. Yet, despite being an advocate for women, especially mothers in science, and all the work she's done with the Parents in Science group, Fernanda still has problems getting funding for her research. I still do not have a really big record on being like a. a um, a researcher in this specific area of mothers and science and everything, even though we have done a lot, it's still really recent. So a lot of times when I try to apply for grants and everything, you say, oh, but you have a, you are a biologist and you are working in this field, so we don't see how you can be doing both things and, and things like that. So, I don't know. It's still something that I see as a big, really big uh, issue in my in, in my career. I asked Fernanda to share some advice for any female scientists who are mothers or those who are considering motherhood and want to continue their work in science. You are not alone. It's something that is it sounds really simple, but uh, it made me. Uh, it's, it was something that I missed when I was going through that uh, period in my life. To know that I wasn't alone. And it was not just myself that was going through that. So the main thing I have to say to anyone that is going through a, a period like that is just is that uh, it's not yourself. It's something really bigger than that. It's an instructional problem we are trying to solve, but it's still really present. So I know it's hard to uh, say just keep up with everything, trying and fighting the system and everything. But I think that's the only way we'll, uh, we'll be able to win this, uh, this battles. Fernanda's story takes me back to episode one of this series, where Monica Stein, the Vice Rector of Research, Partnership and Collaboration at the University de Valle Guatemala, based in Guatemala City, said, There's no cookie cutter woman scientist. There's no one single way to approach science and do science. That was a big one for me. I thought there was a single path. You got your PhD, you got your postdoc, you got your tenure, otherwise you're a failure. It's okay to be a woman science in teaching, a woman scientist in teaching. It's okay to be a woman scientist in industry. It's okay to be a woman scientist in management. Because as long as you're having impact, and that impact is fulfilling you, and also contributing to building a better ecosystem, you are a woman in science. And I think that's very important that women internalize, that there are many ways to be successful at what they want to be. Fernanda's story is just one example of this. And in the next episodes, we'll share stories from different female Latin American scientists who've made it to the top of their chosen science career professions. Thanks for listening. I'm Julie Gould. Thank you.